Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm so happy to uh, be with you this evening. I am Reverend Layla Ortiz, and I serve as the Bishop of the Metropolitan Washington, D.C. Synod. We find our nation and our church at a tipping point, and so many of us are wondering, could this be the moment? Could this be the moment that we finally see a change in our country? Is this the moment where people will finally recognize systemic racism for the problem and the evil that it is? Is this the moment for our country and for our church uh, and beyond that, even for ourselves? If so, if this is the case, where, where do we go from here? To engage this question, I wanted to gather us as a synod and as a church, and I wanted to invite critical thinkers and trusted colleagues that consistently match their words with their actions, because what we need right now is action. With us tonight is Reverend Dr. Stephen Ray. He's the president of the Chicago Theological Seminary and president of the Society for the Study of Black Religion. We also have Dr. Ulysses Burley III. He's the founder of UB The Cure, a proprietary consulting company on the intersection of faith, health, and human rights. And we have Rosella H. White, author of Love Big, The Power of Revolutionary Relationships to Heal the World, and owner of RHW Consulting. Last night, during our service of repentance and the commemoration of the Emanuel Nine, we were invited. We were invited to faithfully and boldly listen, learn, and lead in our discipleship and in our ministries. And so tonight, we will faithfully and boldly listen and learn. We'll listen and learn from our colleagues and siblings in Christ. But before we do, let us pray. Dear God, you are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning and the end, our beginning and our end, and you have called us into being. Help us to be present this evening. Help us to be exactly who you have called us to be. Help us to continue to fight the good fight, and in this instance, Help us to have ears to listen, eyes to see, and hearts to receive. We pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. We'll begin this evening of listening and learning with Dr. Stephen Ray. And I want to say, first and foremost, that all three of the people that we have here tonight are truly, truly good and dear friends, um, and not only friends, people that I genuinely respect and listen to quite often. They have helped shape my thinking, my worldview, my discipleship, and even my faithful walk with Christ. And so I genuinely, as I prayed, I'm genuine when I ask and pray to God that we are all present this evening to listen, to take note, to really even wrestle with what we listen with what we hear tonight and so we'll begin with dr stephen ray as he will share the remarks that he has prepared for us this evening and help us to frame our theological thinking around this topic of the sin of racism in our country in our church and even in ourselves thank you dr ray thank you Thank you, and uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity, uh, Bishop Ortiz. One of the things that I count as one of the great blessings in my career was my teaching time at the Lutheran Theological Seminary of Philadelphia. Um, not only because I met um, wonderful people like Bishop Ortiz, but also because it gave me a very real opportunity to um, engage and significantly understand in different ways. Um, the Lutheran tradition and the way 
um, it understood the world. I myself come from the reform tradition, so I describe myself as a dyed in the wool Calvinist. Um, so that means that I come from a slightly different vantage point, but one of the things that I hope um, is helpful is that gaining an appreciation um, for the generosity of spirit um, of the Lutheran tradition and of the people that it tries to shape um, are largely what's framing the uh, comments that I'm going to be making this evening. So I think I'd like to begin by first saying that um, I think what we're dealing with um, is a theological problem within the church. So for the church specifically and for Christian communities within the church, uh, we're dealing with a theological problem, but we're doing so in ways that we have disallowed the possibility of our tradition guiding us as we think about this. So what I mean by that is that in a very real and significant way, um, one of the things that um, is endemic to many of our communities, and um, uh, this goes across our traditions, is um, uh, a disallowance of the possibility of conceiving that evil actually can take form in the world that evil can actually materialize itself in the world and not just be something that is an inspiration for ill deeds and an inspiration for bad actions. Because I think that one of the things that happens when we disallow that is that we fall back on what I think is a facile language of sin. So we talk about sin in such ways as if it's not um, uh, a matter of cosmic significance, but it's simply a matter of people doing good things or bad things, participating in good actions or bad actions, participating in systems um, that are wreaking harm. So I think the first thing I want to lift up is the need for us to recover this as a theological problem, because that then opens the door for us to begin to conceive of what we find ourselves in the midst of in ways that we can find um, resources from our tradition. So for instance, one of the uh, uh, significant ways that uh, uh, Paul can help us to understand what we're talking about when we talk about the workings of racism is with the idea of the principalities and powers. So if you have a vibrant sense of the principalities and powers, there is a way that you can understand um, that the systems that perform racism in the world, um, uh, distorted police departments, distorted uh, systems of banking, distorted systems of governments, that they're actually performing racism in the world, but that there is something actually more powerful behind them. And the thing behind them is the presumption uh, which goes along with the whole category of race, that there is a qualitative difference between people that God ordains, and that that qualitative difference then authorizes the functioning of systems to disadvantage some while it gives advantage to others. So what ends up happening is that we end up um, doing, uh, like a great movie many years ago called Fallen, with Denzel Washington in it, uh, you know, what happened in that movie was that it was about a demon that moved from person to person. Well, as soon as you caught the person that it was in, it would just jump to the next person. And one of the things that um, happens is that we become so focused on particular manifestations of racism that we don't recognize that the power that gives these manifestations force is something that mutates continually and changes shape and changes form. And that allows us to, to have the same conversation over and over and over again. Uh, I put up on Facebook recently about how exhausting this has been because I'm into my fourth decade of having the same fights. And, um, you know, we're making some progress, but for every step we fall back. But I think once again, for people of religious faith is because we've reduced the engagement to simply one of uh, social action and social activism. Now I put it in that particular term because I know that certainly in um, broadly speaking, a Lutheran understanding of um, the world, that can be too quickly reduced to the idea of works righteousness. 
And with that reduction, it diminishes um, our, uh, um, our in engagement and engagement with our whole selves because we've underestimated what it is that we are dealing with and what we're engaging. So I think the first point is if we theologically understand uh, this to be a struggle, not against this ubiquitous idea of sin um, that really in some ways loses content because we make it so ubiquitous, but we actually realize that we are engaging and encountering evil that is materializing itself um, in our midst, then it takes on a different kind of gravity. Because the thing that we all agree with is that when we talk about something being evil, we're actually talking about something that is opposed to the will and desire of God in the world. And that calls forth within us a different level of engagement. It's not optional at that point, right? If it's just social justice, then it's something that is optional because at the end of the day, our salvation doesn't depend on it. At the end of the day, God doesn't have any salvific interest in social action. It's just a good thing for people to do. But if we rightly conceive of what we're talking about this evening as racism and the way it works in the world with its deadly and lethal force as the actual materialization of evil within our midst, then we can recognize that God may well have salvific interest in how we are engaging the evil in our midst. Now, I'm not saying that we earn our salvation by engaging evil because, I, I, because I'm a Calvinist. I think that um, uh, ultimately salvation is in God's hands, so I don't worry about it. But I am concerned that if we do not engage the evil that materializes itself, then what we've done is that we've demonstrated uh, that God's salvific concern for the entire world is actually immaterial to us and not important at all. That at the end of the day, our faith becomes reduced to worrying about our own personal salvation um, and um, our relationship and being in the world and to the world uh, becomes um, truncated so that this becomes an optional engagement and not one upon which the very salvific drama uh, that God is unfolding in the world is involved with. And I guess the other thing I want to talk about, and I'm just going to do this very briefly, is that one of the greatest difficulties, I think, that most Christians, uh, particularly white Christians, have is making peace with the reality that their ancestors were moral monsters, that to uphold the system of slavery, to engage in the system of genocide of indigenous peoples, to uh, uphold the system of segregation was the work of people who were moral monsters. Now, you know, I, I want to put it in no stark terms because I think that what softening what was going on by saying, oh, they were just people of their time. Oh, they were just people who were living in the customs of their day, lose the sight of the fact of the evil which they did. And as I said a little bit earlier, this is what we're talking about. Um, the forces that are counter to God um, actually materializing in our midst. So I want to give you the idea and um, it's something that, you know, ponder for a while, that you can forgive your ancestors for the evil which they have done, but you cannot excuse them for it. You cannot act as if it was all right. And the debates that we have, particularly around these days, the Confederate monuments, how the Confederacy is uh, understood in our time, how slavery was understood, how our systems of um, uh, uh, education, housing, et cetera, that was shaped by education uh, that was shaped at the time. You know, you can forgive them for the evil that they did, but you have to call it evil. You can't act like, oh, it was just misguided people. Oh, it was just people who were mistaken about what it was that made for the good society. Because I think that if we bring these two things together, number one is that if you for 
forgive yourself, your ancestors, for the evil which they did while recognizing that it was evil, you free yourself from having to live your life as a rationalization for the evil which they did. Because I think that unfortunately in church life, that's what ends up happening, is that more church people live their lives and shape their communities as a rationalization for what they know was wrong, but they can't admit was wrong, so therefore they have to perpetuate it into the future, and they become an enactment and an embodiment of the very thing that they abhor. So I want to just lift up those two points. And once again, I'd like to uh, thank Bishop Ortiz for this wonderful invitation and this opportunity to share a bit of time with you. Dr. Ray, uh, <laughs> if, if everyone was actually listening to all of what you said, every single word, um, that would probably be just enough for one evening to wrestle with and maybe a century <laughs> to wrestle with. Um, I took note, I hope everyone else is also taking note of the things that I heard that are true to my being but hadn't been heard in, in these particular ways. Um, but I really value, I really value the, the grace <laughs> and the pastoral invitation to forgiveness while also naming the sin and the opportunity for freedom and liberation and transformation from that place of forgiving your ancestors and naming the both and, right? Um, what an opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Ray. And we look forward to further conversation with you on July 2nd. And now we want to hear from Dr. Ulysses Burley. Dr. Burley has been a friend for several years now, and I have been sincerely eager almost every other day or week when he offers a moment um, and asking, asking his viewers, can we talk? Um, and every time he says, can we talk, uh, we need to be ready to hear some, some significant and often painful truths that also lead toward a change in behavior, change of a worldview and paradigm. And so, Thank you, Dr. Burley, and we look forward to hearing what you have to share with us this evening. Thank you, Bishop Ortiz, and thank you to all of the uh, distinguished panelists for uh, sharing their wisdom around these difficult issues. Again, I am Ulysses Burley, and I'm the founder of UB The Cure, which is an organization that operates at the intersection of faith, health, and human rights. Uh, now, for some, that might seem like an auspicious combination but I think that they're very much so connected. And it's through those intersections that uh, I view uh, the lens of not only faith, uh, theology, and religion, but also uh, health and human rights. And I think uh, this principle, this concept of intersectionality, which was introduced to us uh, some 30 years ago by Dr. Le Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, um, a, a woman and scholar, um, is the idea that uh, there's this simultaneous experience of categorical and hierarchical classifications, including but not limited to race, class, gender, sexuality, and religion, um, and what are often perceived as disparate forms of oppression, like racism and classism and sexism, are actually these mutually dependent and intersecting principles uh, that together compose this unified system of oppression. Uh, now, I, I mentioned intersectionality and the inclusion in religion, but I'll say that not only is religion a part of this unified system of oppression, but it often informs the system of oppression, especially in the United States context. Uh, Dr. Ray stated that we are in the midst of a theological dilemma, and I agree with that. I would also say that we are in the midst of a moral dilemma. Uh, and that our morality is largely driven by uh, our theological lens. Uh, and so because of that, uh, racism has to then become uh, not only an issue of the church uh, and of our faith, but for the church and for our faith uh, in terms of destabilizing and eventually eradicating uh, the sin, as he named it, of racism. Now, I'm not a theologian. Uh, I am a public health expert, uh, but I am a person of deep faith. Uh, I consider myself to be uh, a lay leader, and I do 
allow my faith to inform uh, much of my uh, work professionally, but also the ways in which I move personally. Uh, and I believe that a disconnect has taken place within Christianity, within our faith context. And I believe that disconnect is at the center of what we are seeing now in our country and what we have seen uh, for the last 400 years. Um, you know, the topic of the series is em embracing, embracing the imago Dei, embracing the image of God. And uh, I was once asked, uh, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? And for me, the answer was very simple. The answer was, it means to be human. Uh, and I say that because if we recall the creation story um, in the first chapter of Genesis, in the 26th verse, God says that God created humankind in God's likeness, both man and woman. God created them. And up until that point, God had made magnificent things, the heavens and the earth and uh, the wild creatures uh, and the seas. Um, but verse 26 was, was the first time that God created anything in God's likeness. And so then the answer, what does it mean to be created in the image of God becomes very simple to me in that it means to be human because God singled us out as special by creating us in God's likeness. And, you know, throughout Genesis and even uh, later, in the Gospels where uh, we talk about the relationship between heaven and earth, it's largely a relationship that has been fractured. And the death of Jesus Christ was supposed to reconcile that relationship. Uh, but in many ways, the fracturing of heaven and earth has been uh, our failure as humans created in the image of God to not just love God, but to love each other and to love ourselves. And so as we are in this season uh, of, of Pentecost, uh, as we have celebrated the Holy Trinity, I lift up a different Trinity, a different triangle, if you will. And it's this triangle um, between the relationship, our vertical relationship with, with God and our horizontal relationship with each other. Um, and then the disconnect that takes place between our loving each other and our loving God. And somewhere down the road, Christianity became loving God only, but not loving God's people. Um, but that's not faith. It's impossible for us to love God, but not love God's people. Uh, and so I see racism being a function of people's inability, not only to love each other, but to love ourselves, right? God realized that uh, we didn't even love ourselves. And so he gave us a new commandment that says, love your neighbors as I first loved you. Um, because maybe loving our neighbors as we first loved ourselves just wasn't good enough. And so uh, we have to uh, reconcile heaven and earth uh, through our relationships uh, down here on earth. Um, and I believe uh, it has to start in the church. And I say racism is a moral dilemma um, because I think much of our country's moral compass is shaped by our theology. Um, but a lot of the morality that we seek isn't being modeled in the church. Um, and so you know, I think about Martin Luther King's favorites, uh, famous statements uh, when he said that, you know, the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in the country. Um, MLK would still be right today. And if you think about our churches, uh, they rarely reflect the ethnic and social uh, and um, identity diverse society that is our country. And yet we expect for society to then mirror something different. And so, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that we are at the precipice of, um, you know, I don't want to call it a, a race war, uh, but things are boiling over, if you will, uh, when this is something that we still haven't settled in our church houses. Uh, and so, you know, I think one of the, things that we have to address as people of faith, uh, as Christians, uh, as a church, uh, is our own failures uh, to model uh, that which we hope for society. Uh, and that until we can reconcile our relationships with each other, 
and only understand that we were all created in the image of God and therefore um, loving each other is loving God, uh, then um, the sin of racism and sexism and classism and all of the other isms will continue to persist. Now, my work is largely around how health and faith and human rights intersect. And the health topic of the year has been COVID-19. And as many of you know, COVID-19 in and of itself has been an exemplar of the racism that pervades and persists in our country. And its impact on people of color, but specifically on black people and Latinx people and indigenous peoples uh, is a direct result of 400 plus years of systematic racism against the least of these. And I think at the crux of what we see in the disproportionality of COVID-19 is again, this inability to embrace the image of God, this inability to realize that everybody was created in the image of God and to be created in the image of God means to be human. And so this then is where uh, the intersection of human rights uh, comes in. And I believe that for our lifetime, we've marched and we've protested uh, even as a church uh, for civil rights, for the right to vote and for the right to employment and for the right uh, to love who we love uh, under the law. But civil rights is not enough to cover uh, the full humanitarian needs of uh, humanity. And so again, it harkens back to being human and being human being enough to be loved like God and then how that manifests in the ways in which uh, society makes us sick and those ways then manifest into viruses uh, that segregate on the basis of race and class and socioeconomic status and again it's a failure of as Bishop Ortiz says, it's not church uh, and society, but church and society. Uh, and the fact that society is often led by our theological compass, our moral compass is often calibrated based on our faith and our faith right now is fractured. And so uh, the church has to repent of this country's uh, first sin, the sin of racism, but also one of Christianity's first sins, the sin of racism. Um, you know, when slaves were packed into that boat some 400 years ago in West Africa, uh, the last door that they went through had a cross over it. Uh, that's not by coincidence. And then Christianity was used as a tool to oppress people instead of liberate people uh, once uh, those stolen bodies were brought to this land. And we haven't reconciled since. And so we have to repent, but then we have to repair uh, and we have to reconcile heaven and earth, uh, not by just our vertical relationships with God, but also our horizontal relationships with each other, understanding that um, that triangle is only complete when then our love for God and our love for each other connects back um, to the Creator. And so uh, I hope to be able to expound on these thoughts around uh, how our humanity and the acknowledgement of our humanity is at the root of how it is that we get past uh, this sin of racism, uh, but also how it is that sickness and illness and dis-ease um, continue to uh, disproportionately impact people of color uh, in this country. And so uh, I look forward to discussing more about Christ, color, and uh, COVID-19, or in the words of 
my brother, Dr. Michael or Eric Dyson, uh, COVID-1619, because in many ways, uh, we are seeing more of the same of what uh, we have seen over these last 400 years as it relates uh, to racism. And so uh, I'll finally say again, to embrace the image of God, to be created in the image of God is simply to be human and uh, humanity has to restore our love for each other uh, in order to get past uh, racism that pervades not only our society, but our church. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burley. My, my hand hurts from writing and from taking notes. Um, you, said, you said several things that, uh, again, I hadn't heard in that particular way. Um, to love each other is to love God. What would it mean for us to take that seriously, to understand humanity, to recognize the image of God in each and every one of us? in each and every human being, and not only recognize, but embrace, right? Embrace the image of God and love each other and love God by loving each other. Um, thank you. Thank you. I also look forward to more conversation, especially, especially when it comes to the implications of health and policies and reform and how we engage as Christians in the world, not just in the safety of our congregations and our churches, but that we embody our vocations and our discipleship in the world for the sake of change and restoration. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burley. And now we, we want to hear from Rosella White. As many of you know, Rosella is uh, one of my, if not my best friend, um, and honestly, one of the people who challenges me quite a bit on all things, um, including including what it means to lead um, in such a critical time um, in, as we've heard and said so many times, in, in, in this time, to be called for such a time as this. Um, as, as you know, she's the author of Love Big, Revolutionary Relationships. This is her call. This is her invitation. And I think it's prophetic for our time that not only are we being invited to recognize God in humanity, um, but what it means to not only recognize God in humanity, but be in relationship as humans um, for the sake of liberation and transformation. And so thank you, Rosella, for joining us tonight. And I look forward to learning from you yet again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Bishop Ortiz, to the Metro DC Synod, and all of those working for racial justice and equity um, through a faith lens. Also, thank you to both of my esteemed colleagues and friends, um, Dr. Burley and Dr. Ray, um, for the thoughts that you have provided. Um, I think I have to begin with something that was shared right before um, this opened up for our conversation. And it was that we all said yes to this invitation because Bishop Ortiz invited us. Right? Because of the relationship that we have with um, the Bishop of the Metro DC Synod, we said yes to be in conversation about racial justice and racial equity. Um, I'm going to do something. I'm sitting outside and it's raining and the rain just came and hit me because of course it would in this exact moment. Um, but we all said yes to this invitation because of relationship, right? Relationship has the power to change and transform and challenge and lead us into deeper awareness and connection. And so one of my arguments is that fundamentally, we are not um, in relationship with ourselves, with each other, and ultimately with the world, right? Um, we are not in relationship with ourselves, and this can be seen in the fact that so many of us um, are not able to speak life over self or life over others because we haven't taken the time to actually dig down and root into, as Dr. Burley talked about, our humanity into the reality that we have been made in the image of God. Um, and by not being in relationship with ourselves, I think that it almost becomes impossible to fully love another. Um, you know, in referencing the greatest commandment of what does the Lord your God require of you, um, but to um, love God and love neighbor as you love yourself. And I often say, how do you love someone as yourself if you don't um, love yourself? I don't know how to do that. 
I haven't seen that done very well. We aren't seeing that done very well. And we know that people don't love self because they're able to spew hatred. They're able to perpetuate in ignorance or perpetuate hatred and continue and consist in ignorance. And so part of this work, if not what I would argue is foundational to this work, is to come to know yourself, come to know your history, your history, um, and come to understand and make peace, as Dr. Ray talked about, with what happened in the past and how you are going to choose to show up differently in the present moment so that our future can be different. I believe that we have the power to change the trajectory that we're on for a different reality to be lived out in the future. So relationships, right, are the core of all of this. The second thing I would share, um, so my book is Love Big, The Power of Revolutionary Relationships to Heal the World. And I, I use the moniker of the Love Big Coach um, because loving big for me is, is the work of building an ethic of love that undergirds our relationships with each other, our relationship with self, and our relationship and action that we show up with in the world. Um, and to love big for me comes directly from what I saw and what I see, what I understand in the Trinity, right? In the Trinity, we see a God that is in love with God's own self, that is in relationship with God's own self. And this relationship is marked by three things. In the creator, um, or in God the creator, we see creativity. We see the creation of the heavens and the earth and ultimately of humanity in the image and likeness of God. Um, and not just physically in the likeness, but I, used, I think about that also in terms of the characteristics of God and God's heart. The second thing that we see um, in, the, in Christianity is God coming to earth in the form of Jesus, love incarnate, right? And we see Jesus as the liberator. So we know that love is present where liberation lies and where um, people are working towards um, holistic liberation from systems, structures, powers, and principalities, and also um, liberation from ways of being that have been oppressive, ways of being that we have practiced on ourselves and ways of being that we then do with others. And then in the third thing, we see um, God as spirit, God as um, the advocate that is promised to be with us. And in that, the advocate then um, provides sustenance for our holistic beings, for our minds, for our hearts, for our bodies, and for our souls. And so I argue that we know where love is present, where there is creativity, where there is liberation, and where there is sustenance. And so I'm very clear when I talk about love, I'm not talking about romance and sentimentality, even though anyone who knows me knows I am a huge romantic, right? I love love. I'm in love with love. And yet my conversations about love are to move towards an ethic and a way of being that embodies creativity, liberation, and sustenance for our holistic beings, because I believe that that has the power to heal and transform us. The other thing I would say um, about love is that when I talk about nurturing love of self and love of others, um, I'm talking about a love that's life-giving, a love that is just the seeking, and a love that ultimately is world-changing. Um, we are in a time, and I too, it's not been four decades that I have been engaging this work as the esteemed Dr. Ray. I think I would just say two decades that I've been engaging this work. And if he's, I would say I'm exhausted. So I don't know what Dr. Ray you actually are because I'm exhausted, right? Of, after 20 years of continually teaching and engaging and being curious and helping people understand the humanity I mean, because that's what we're talking about, right? When we talk about Black Lives Matter, when we lift up the voices of Black Indigenous people of color, when we um, engage people in conversation to talk about being liberators and, and actually embodying faith, we're actually arguing for people to see us as human and just to do the right thing. Do the right thing, right? Um, but because our moral, our morality has become um, so off track, like the whole thing has blown up. We don't even know what right is anymore. We don't, and we know that we don't know what right is because I see pastors day in and day out in the ELCA, in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and in other faith expressions having to explain why Black Lives Matter is actually uh, a prophetic statement, is a pastoral statement, is a powerful statement steeped in faith, not a partisan or political statement. So I believe that 
we don't even know what's right anymore. We don't even know what's moral anymore. We don't even know what's just anymore because we are now having to argue for the humanity of people who look different than what the majority culture, which I would argue is no longer the majority culture, but what whiteness has taught us, what white supremacy um, has led us to understand. And then the last thing I'll say is this, and this is what I'll get more into on my session as we dig into, okay, these are things that we understand, like headwise or intellectually. These are things that we feel heart-wise, and these are things that we know in a different way in our soul. But now how is it we show up in the world, right? What do we do in terms of action? And I'm going to talk more about that in the session. Um, I believe it's July 30th. But I just want to say that we have to, first and foremost, have a vision for what we're hoping to achieve, right? We have to be very clear when we talk about racial justice, when we talk about racial equity, when we talk about racism, white supremacy, white privilege, any of these terms that we throw out, we have to first understand what they mean and how we're defining them and then create or cast the vision for what our engagement in this work is actually going to do, what it's going to be, how it's going to, how we hope it will impact our world. And then we have to start looking at alignment. And I say that there are certain things that must be in alignment in order for us to actually reclaim our morality, to understand what is right, and to, to be about liberation and justice. And so we have to interrogate our beliefs, we have to outline our values, and we have to then engage and enact our behaviors in ways that reflect the vision, the beliefs, and the values that we've lifted up. And when we don't do that work, we find ourselves misaligned, we find ourselves not in alignment, um, and that then leads to the continued chaos and lack of peace. And then I'll just leave, or I'll just end my, my part with a quote from Lilla Watson, um, who is an Aboriginal activist out of Australia and in true collectivist mindset, she doesn't like to necessarily be solely attributed to this quote because she believes it's a quote that came out of the Aboriginal struggle for justice and for human rights. But she says, if you have come here to help me, right, you can go home. But if you have come here because your liberation is bound up in mine, then let's work together. And for me, ultimately, this work of racial justice and racial equity is about understanding, especially as people of faith, that our liberation is bound one to another. So I'm not just interested in working in or talking about or engaging issues of racial injustice because of Black and Indigenous people of color. I'm interested in doing it because I believe white folks are fundamentally oppressed and that until they recognize that their liberation will come through this work, we're going to continue in this cycle. Thank you. We're, we're friends, we're all friends. And so I feel like each of you have, have had some significant like drop the mic moments. And so I thank you for those moments that kind of rattle us and kind of wake us up to the possibility of a new way of being. Um, and a, not only a new way of being, um, but a new, a new way of being, <laughs> being in the world, right? Uh, of being um, as we have called, right? As we have been called into being by our creator. Um, I remember in seminary, Dr. Ray introduced me to Howard Thurman, who most of us know as a, as a mystic theologian, mentor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I remember reading Jesus and the Disinherited. I remember listening to his lectures and I became so enamored by his thinking, his preaching, his theology, and um, the grace that and love that undergirded everything that he said. Um, and one of the things that I, I share this, especially with, with the youth of our synod and other synods, um, mainly because it impacted me in a way that it has transformed how I engage humanity. Um, and I'll mention another thing too that I remember specifically from your, your class, Dr. Ray. Um, but Howard Thurman taught us, taught us that he, well actually in one of his lectures he says that he was before the mirror one day and he looked in the mirror and he said, well, God, God could have made a better looking man, but he didn't. This is who he's created. And yet, as he's saying that as he looked in, in through the mirror, he realized, but in me is an expression of God that has never been before 
and will never be again after me, right? And so that moment, that was like, wait a minute, right? Some, again, something that we've known in our hearts, we know in our spirits when we hear it, but we hadn't yet heard it in that particular way. Each and every single human being carries and is an expression of God, an expression of God that has never been before, never been before, and will never be again. If we could only value and cherish every human being as that expression of God, what would our relationships look like? What would our church look like? What would our world look like? That it's not about who's in and who's out. It doesn't even matter what shade of color. It matters that every color is an expression of God that has never been and will never be again. Um, I, I, I engage humanity in that way. Um, and I thank God for Dr. Howard Thurman. I thank God for each of you and the ways that God has shaped you and your thinking and your worldview to help us uh, reframe our own worldviews and engage the world just a bit differently. I also, I wanna say, I remember um, Dr. Ray, you introduced me to uh, Emmanuel Levinas um, Jewish philosopher. And I share this again, I, the things that we share and that we know and that have impacted our lives, we share over and over and over again, hoping that someone will listen because it transformed us, right? Um, but Emmanuel Levinas, he talks about ontological murder, right? He talks about how when we conceptualize another human being according to a label, according to a stereotype, and we say black, brown, evil, poor, sick, right? And we treat each other according to the concept we have engaged in ontological murder because we have denied the humanity and the being of the person and reduced it to a concept, right? And so I press all of us and I, I invite each and every one of us to be mindful and to recognize when we are engaging another human being according to a construct that has been created for us and against us in ways that coerce us into believing that we're keeping safe because we are not engaging that concept over there that doesn't have a face, a name, or humanity. That's the call. That's the invitation for us to recognize the Imago Dei and not fall into the sin of ontological murder, not fall into the sin of racism, white supremacy, not fall under the trap, right, of evil in the way that, in such a way that we cannot but respond in action. And again, not for the sake of, of eternal salvation, but for the sake of temporal salvation, right? For the sake of the here and now, for the sake of liberation, transformation, renewal, for the sake of sanity, right? For the sake of being able to breathe in Jesus' name and for it being able to, as, as Dr. Burley, you shared, I mean, what would it look like for us to be honest? That's it. Let's be honest and name evil for what it is. Call a thing what it is so that we can be liberated to be and live into the being that God has called us to be and to recognize the beings that are before us that will never be again. Um, what would that look like? And so the conversation, um, I'm stirred up, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready, let's go, let's continue to have the conversation, but let's act, let's engage. And as we were invited last night, let's listen for the purposes of learning, for the purposes of leading, leading a movement of true, true revolutionary love, right? That transforms, that liberates, that actually affords the space for healing um, and transformation. I am eager. I'm eager for that possibility. Um, as all of you know, I am not, <laughs> I, I am a Latina woman. My roots are African. My roots are indigenous. My roots are Spanish. There's conflict even in my whole embodiment, right? 
The Spanish enslaved the African Amer the African people, right? The native people were stripped from their land. I am a con I struggle. <laughs> I struggle in my own being, and yet the invitation is to be and to name the thing what it is, right? This is the truth of my history. I am complicated. It's messy. It's difficult, and we can name it. We can forgive it, and we can engage in the world in a way that is honest. Um, for the sake of transparency, for the sake of vulnerability that heals, for the sake of, again, sanity and the ability to breathe just a bit lighter. Um, and so I invite the Synod, um, I invite those who are watching, I invite you to invite others to continue to engage this conversation along with us and the racial equity team of our Synod. Um, this, this is not an option. Uh, engaging this, uh, engaging the sin of racism, engaging the evil in this world, um, naming the thing that it is, this is not an option um, for us. We are and follow a Jesus who was consistent and unapologetic in matters of justice. We are followers of Jesus. We are disciples of Jesus. And so we will follow. We will follow with God's help and in Jesus' name. And so I remind you that on July 2nd, at 7 p.m. I know that that Facebook is struggling, but YouTube is strong, and so make sure to log in on July 2nd, where we'll hear, continue to listen and learn from Dr. Stephen Ray. On July 16th, again 7 p.m., we'll continue to listen and learn from Dr. Ulysses Burley, and on the 30th, July 30th at 7 p.m., we will continue to listen and learn from Rosella H. White, and we will lead. We will lead by example and it will be, again, it will be messy and difficult and challenging and we'll do it anyway and we'll do it together and we'll do it in Jesus' name. And so I thank you. I thank you for saying yes uh, to this invitation. I thank you each, my goodness. Um, we've done it before. We can do it again. Just talk for hours and hours and hours. Um, I hope and pray that you who are watching are inspired by the Holy Spirit um, because that's what's happened in this space. The Holy Spirit has used each and every person here to inspire some movement and some stirring um, in ways that are gracious and not about guilt and not about shame, none of that. This is all about love, love for each other and love for God, love for what all of what God has created. Um, and so thank you. We, we didn't even meet the hour. We don't need to meet the hour, um, but we can be grateful and we can continue to faithfully and boldly listen, learn, and lead with God's help and in Jesus' name. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>